Guys, I don't have any piercing on me. I don't know any tattoo artists, and I've never been to any tattoo parlor. But I've got two tattoos on my body. And I wear these tattoos boldly, I wear them proudly, and I wear them foolishly. These are my scars of war, if you will. They're things I collected in my youth. And if I was asked to show what I did in my youth, I can show these two tattoos. When I was 15, I went for a sleepover at uh, my best friend's place. Waswa's mom was American, and his dad was Luya. <laughs> he had been my friend since Standard 5. You know, he thought I was Mr. Funnyman. I was, of course, the king of Mchongwano. I wasn't first body, as you can tell. And you can imagine in Standard 5, I was much smaller. I liked that his mother used to pack for him what they used to call peanut butter jelly sandwich. <laughs> to us, Mraya, it is bread with peanut butter na jam. <laughs> and because Waswa didn't like it so much, I ended up eating a lot of it. Now, this holiday, it was an April holiday, I was informed too, I went for a sleepover at Waswa's place. It was a big thing, because in our house, you never left the home unless you had been sent to the duka. This was a house where we were eight boys, and my dad was pretty much military. You never went out, and you never got visited. In fact, the last boy I remember visiting was when I was in nursery school, and my brother was in standard two, and this kid was chased all the way back to his house by my dad. <laughs> Bringing up eight boys, my dad had to be a bit militant, but he was very methodical about it. When you got a beating, it came with some teaching. So I remember um, one of my brothers getting a beating, and uh, it was quite methodical. He was called to the sitting room, and the Bible was called for. <laughs> and when the Bible came, he went right to the place. Spare the rod and spoil the child. <laughs> and he said in Gekoyo, did I write this? And you had to answer, of course not. <laughs> I am ordered from above to do what I'm just about to do to you. And that was my dad. So now I'd been at Waswa's place from Friday, and on Monday morning, I was in a bad accident. We had been riding bikes all morning, and riding the bike had become now boring. So what we did is we took Nasike, Waswa's small sister's BMX bike, and made it a Kome. We took the handlebars, pushed them forward and downwards. And it became a Kome. And we were riding this bike down a 50 meter descent, around a bend, and then we would make a round and all the way back up. And it was good fun. It was the ride of death. <laughs> now, on this one ride, it was my turn, I was going down that hill and I could tell I have overshot the speed. And the way I could tell is because the sleeper I was stopping the bike with <laughs> was getting very hot and it was tearing. Now I was almost down there and I had to make a decision. I either was going to make a corner and bang into the moti that was parked right after the corner, or I was going to go into someone's bedroom through the window, <laughs> or I was going to just stop the bike with the road cab. So I went with option number three. Hit the curb I did, flew into the air, and I can tell you, it was a long minute. But when I landed, my elbow was up here. By the time Waswa's mom was coming, I was in excruciating pain. I can tell you, I've not felt pain like that. So she rushed me to a pretty decent private hospital. I was taken to Mpisha Hospital. And when they looked at it, they said I needed to go to theater but I needed a down payment of 12,000 Kenya shillings. Now, this is a big decision. And my dad had to be called. So he was at work somewhere in Roisambu, and they made the call, and he came on the line. And he spoke to us as mom for a minute, and he said, get Kerry on the phone. So I came on the phone. And all he said 
this good old man was, when were you supposed to come back home? <laughs> and I said, yesterday, Sunday. When is today? Monday. Give the phone back to us, was mom. <laughs> the phone was given back, and he said, let's meet at K&H. Kenyatta National Hospital was the punishment for being foolish. And I went to K&H, and um, I was there for a minute, and they did this operation where they went in and put some metal rods to bring back the, the, the it was multiple fracture and a dislocation. They put three rods all the way up the humerus, almost to the elbow. And they stitched it up and then wrapped it up, and I went back to school. But these rods had to be removed a few weeks later. And when I went back, because I took myself back to Kenyatta National Hospital, <laughs> I went and found Dr. Kuria ready for me. So I was wheeled into theater, and just about the moment they were just about to put me under, Dr. Kuria announced, rather dramatically, that I don't have consent from my parents to get anesthesia. <laughs> but he had a solution. He said to me, if you could stand the fracture that you had, you can stand any pain in the world. So option one was for me to just wait for another day, another theater day. This was 1993, and there were so many people coming from the Rift Valley because of the post-election tribal clashes, and the theater was fully booked for many weeks. Option two was to chomoa the wires rife rife. <laughs> I decided to go dry fry. <laughs> so I held out the hand for Dr. Kuria, and he removed two wires. Guys, let me tell you, there's no way of explaining it. But suffice it to say that any moment they touched any of those rods, I felt it up my arm through the humerus, onto my shoulder, into my entire body, soul, and spirit. I could feel it. <laughs> Pain untold. So he pulled out two of them, and I was just about to walk out of theater. When I said to him, I thought there were three. This is a whole orthopedic doctor. So he was offended. And he asked, who is the doctor here? Am I the doctor or are you the doctor? And we both agreed he's the doctor. <laughs> but he decided to take up the x-ray sheet and put it on the light box. And true, there were three wires. So don't imagine the madarao that the third wire was removed with. <laughs> but it was removed. So they stitched back the hand, they wrapped it up, and I went back to school. All the while, when I was doing this, even with my sling, I'd been trying to exercise my hand by doing everything that I was doing with my right hand, also with my left hand. So I loved drawing, I loved painting, I loved doing these uh, artistic things. So I would draw with my right hand, I would draw with my left hand, I would do calligraphy with my right, do calligraphy with my, with my left. And at the same time, I was doing physiotherapy. So I did physiotherapy for a few months, actually almost a year, and at some point, Dr. Kuria discontinued it. And he told me that if I could eat with my hand and wipe my behind, that's as much as I would need my hand to do <laughs> in my life. So I decided it was okay, and I went on with life. So I'd been honing my skill in drawing, and a year later I walked into Nation Studios, and um, I went to the Nation. Uh, that time it was the Sunday Nation. And I said to them, I think I can draw cartoons for you. And they said to me, we are going to try, out, try you out. You're going to draw for us cartoons for three weeks. And if the kids like it, because it was a young nation, we're going to have you on. And let me tell you, I gave it my best shot. Both hands. I presented my work. They put it up for three weeks. The kids loved it. And Head on Corition went on to be the longest running youth <laughs> column in, in, in the history of Sunday Nation. Now, 15 years later, after my first tattoo, this is the first tattoo, as you can see, they were stitching as if they were stitching a gunny bag. Sean Wakama Gunia. Fifteen years later, when I was on the campaign trail, I was attacked by a gang of goons. Some opponents did not want me on the ballot paper, and they sent some goons because they wanted me dead. I was chapward. I was really beaten to a pulp. And before I passed out, these guys who had been surrounding me all the while with these crude weapons, 
one of them attempted to hit my head for the umpteenth time. So I lifted up this hand, and the jembe stick, the whole stick, hit my hand and broke both the ulna and the radius, and my hand went limp. So I went to hospital, and this time round, Professor Mulimba was on it. He did a pretty decent job. And I can tell you this is how far medicine had gone in 15 years. <laughs> Advancement in science. Let me tell you, they put a metal rod in there, which I removed much later. But I gave an interview when I was in the hospital with my sling and running late on my campaigns because now I was spending too much time in hospital. And I gave that, that interview you give as a politician. They can break our bones, <laughs> but they will never break our spirit. A few weeks later, I was back on the campaign trail, quite behind on the campaign, and at this time we were approaching the nominations. And it does help when you're a political candidate, if your presidential candidate knows you. Now, me being quite an, an, an unexpected, and let me say an extraordinary candidate then, I'm sure my candidate did not know me. And I made a decision that I'm going to be boldly foolish and find a way to get to him. And the opportunity for me was the day that he was presenting his papers at KICC to the Electoral Commission. And I said on this day, I will look for an opportunity to shake the candidate's hand. He will know there is a candidate in Dagoretti by the name of John K.J. Carey. And to KICC I went. And on this day, because he was presenting his papers, the whole world was at KICC, at the courtyard. So I walked through the humanity that was there, and I made it to the stairs, and when I was at the stairs, I saw his convoy. There was his car, and right behind his car was this equally big 4x4, and it was kitted with a sound address system. And I said to myself, be bold, be foolish. And I jumped back in onto where the convoy was, and I walked straight to this car that had the sound address system. And I said, whatever come May, I will be the MC for the day. <laughs> so I went into this car, and as fate would have it, the candidate's sit sister was sitting there and a driver. I don't know what had happened to the MC. I think he had absconded or he was late. So I went into this car, and I sat back left. Important man. I was so confident, no one asked who I was. <laughs> And I waited for the candidate to descend from the stairs at KICC, and I was, as he was coming down, I worked this crowd into a frenzy. I put my everything into it. The candidate got into the car, and we had a road show around Nairobi, and everywhere we stopped, I would work this crowd to a frenzy. Make sure I am the last guy before the candidate, and I was the guy handing over the microphone to the presidential candidate. I can tell you by the time we were getting to Kangemi, he had asked who that boy was. <laughs> and by the time we were getting to, to Dagoretti, I was the only guy on top in the sunroof with the presidential candidate with our heads up there and talking to the Raya. <laughs> well, let me say that it earned me a nomination. And a week later, uh, we, we, you know, with the help of the candidate and, of course, my party, I won the nomination. I won't talk about the election of 07. It went the way it did. But 10 years later, I got to be elected the Member of Parliament for the Great South with a landslide win. <laughs> my story is about tattoos that you carry in life. It doesn't matter what it is that you aspire to be. I can tell you that life will leave you with scars. Whatever your scars are, wear them boldly, wear them proudly, and wear them foolishly. And that is my boldly foolish story. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.